Back to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we turn our attention this morning, and we'll pick up where we left off last time at the 16th verse of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. It's at page 554 in your pew Bible, if that's helpful for you. So far, Kohelet, the uh, preacher, as we translate it into English, has in his wisdom book taken us to terrible depths and to awesome heights. He started off by showing us the undeniable vanity, the undeniable reality of vanity, that is, the ostensible, ostensible uh, meaninglessness, inscrutability, aimlessness, in a word, vanity, of life under the sun. Life since the fall in the sin in Genesis 3 has lost the key to itself, leaving Christians and unbelievers alike groping for the meaning of it all. Like nature and even time itself, life seems to turn in unending cycles. And when we consider it, when we launch out on our pursuit for that key to unlock the mysteries and find it a futile chase, we human beings are left with a sense of unease, of restlessness, of lostness in the universe, and even despair. The answer we found is not to be found in pleasure. The answer is not to be found in projects. The answer is not to be found in work, it cannot be found in play, it cannot be found in people. The answer cannot even be found in wisdom itself. We might as well be chasing after the wind, he says. Vanity of vanities, he concludes. But then we came to what has been described as an oasis of optimism in the desert of despair. Uh, at the end of chapter 2, when God finally appears, appears rightly, that is, uh, though we're not given the answers, we are given the right perspective, the right, the proper world view. And that is that you and I don't need the answers so much as we need Him. And finding Him, we learn that we may still enjoy our lives. We may still have happiness and joy in the good gifts He has given us, in good food and drink, in our work, and in the lawful pleasures that He gives us. All of them as gifts, and along with them the grace to enjoy those gifts. What is more, as we learned last time from the first half of chapter 3, contrary to, the, to coming in dreary cycles, God actually sovereignly ordains the times for everything in the world and in our lives. The time for you to be born, the moment of your death, and everything in between comes to you from the hand of, well, you just confessed it a moment ago, of your heavenly Father. Still doesn't unravel the mysteries, does it? Doesn't supply the missing parts that cannot be counted. It doesn't straighten the parts that are bent in our lives and in the world. But at least by faith we may have confidence, as you've just confessed, that whatever comes, happiness or sadness, love or loss, prosperity, or poverty, war, and peace. All these things, all of them, come to us from the hand of our Heavenly Father, from the loving hand of our Heavenly Father. And He sovereignly, we learn, makes everything beautiful in its time. Everything is made beautiful in its time. So, so again, he sees the same conclusion, verse 12, there is nothing better for us than that we should be joyful and do good as long as we live. Eating, drinking, working, these are among the plethora, the cornucopia 
of good gifts that the Lord has given us in this life and in this world. The best we can do is happily submit to His kind and perfect will, obey Him, receive from Him what He has for us with thankful hearts. But now the pendulum swings again, as it will in this entire entire book. In fact, the more I, I study this book, the more it seems that even the structure of the book itself is intended as a grand illustration of our lives, ebbing and flowing as they do, swinging from one side to the other, just as the poem we read uh, last week in the beginning of chapter 3. Indeed, within the passage we will read this morning, we see the pendulum swing first one way and then the other and then back again. Maybe pendulum is, is, is not the right analogy. Maybe it's even too gentle. Koheleth uh, switches from light to shadow and back again from dark, dark to, to sunny are sometimes so rapid that our heads are left spinning. But isn't that the nature of life itself? Let's pray. Father, we pray for the grace to receive what your word has to say. And we thank you that it is so truthful and so clearly uh, applicable to our lives. You understand us. For you have not only made us, but our Savior has lived this life in this sad life world, and he is a perfectly sympathetic high priest. So as we pray for the help that we need to read and hear and understand your word, we do so with the confidence of praying in his name. Amen. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we'll begin at verse 16 and continue our reading through the third verse of chapter 4. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them and that they, may, uh, that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath and man has no advantage over the beasts for all is vanity All go to one place, all are from the dust, and to the dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of the oppressed. And they had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors was power, and there was no one to comfort them. And I thought the dead who are already dead more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. If you have eyes in your head, you see injustice. And you see it everywhere. Solomon did not have to look very far to find it, nor do you. Open your newspaper, turn on your television, listen to the radio, and justice is happening all day, every day. There's there's nothing new under the sun, is there? 
as it was in his day, so it is in ours. But what never stops making us sick to our stomachs is the places where we find and experience injustice. And the very places where we expect to find just the opposite. Writes Kohelet, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. You can hear the frustration in his voice, can't you? Uh, you can feel it too because it's your frustration too. It's become cliche for us to say he got away with murder because it happened so terribly often. While innocent people, people who have committed no crime are sometimes punished terribly. The same year that I started out as pastor here in Owensboro, 1994, there was a murder committed in St. Louis where Debbie and I had lived just a year earlier. And for the killing of Marcus Boyd, another man by the name of Lamar Johnson was tried, convicted, and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. So for as long as I've been your pastor here, that Missouri man, Lamar Johnson, has been locked away in prison. But four days ago, on Valentine's Day, Johnson was set free after nearly three decades of imprisonment. Turns out that Lamar had a clear alibi, uh, though he had a clear alibi for that night, and in the absence of any physical evidence whatsoever, Mr. Johnson was convicted based on the false testimony of a single witness who just recently retracted, recanted his testimony while two other men have sworn out affidavits of guilt. Johnson was not even involved in Boyd's death. The story gets even worse, though. An investigation now shows that the lone eyewitness to the shooting received more than $4,000 in payments from prosecutors to testify and identify Johnson as one of the shooters. The witness, Greg Elking, has also revealed that the state also helped him resolve several outstanding traffic violations. None of this, of course, was revealed to Johnson's defense lawyers at the time of his trial. After the judge's ruling a few days ago on Tuesday that Johnson is, as it turns out, innocent of the crime, St. Louis Circuit Attorney Kimberly Gardner said this, This is an amazing day that we showed that the city of St. Louis and the state of Missouri is about justice. Well, that may be true, at least on Tuesday, but Johnson, now a free man, is also, by the way, a penniless man, a homeless man, ineligible for any compensation for his imprisonment. He is free, and he is totally impoverished. Even justice after the fact is not apparently without injustice. Among the most frustrating things about the whole devastating debacle is, of course, where the original injustice took place, right in the very place where we should have expected justice, in the halls of justice, in the courts of the land that pledges liberty and justice for all. Of course, injustice takes place in all manner of ways, doesn't it? And places where one might hope that justice would be found. Not only in the civil courts, but in the ecclesiastical courts, that is, in the church, and in the home. Ten days ago, Christianity Today broke the story of a church whose elders had publicly disciplined a woman in 2002 for refusing to take back her husband. As it turned out, the woman's fears proved true, and her husband went to prison for child molestation and abuse in 2005. According to the article, the church 
has never retracted its discipline, hasn't even so much as apologized to her in 20 years since. Now that's a live case, and I'm not making a judgment from the pulpit today concerning that matter. I only supply it because I think it is illustrative of many such true situations in which injustice is found not only in the civil courts, but in the church courts as well. The places of justice and of righteousness are all too often places where, the just, where just the opposite is found. Families, too, where one might certainly hope for a husband and father who loves his wife and children well and therefore cares for, protects, and provides for them are instead, sadly, sometimes places of deep, deep injustice, abusive fathers and mothers, or neglectful, steal childhoods and start children off in life not only jaded but deeply wounded. Nearly every Wednesday evening we pray for nations in the world where children, if they convert from Islam to Christianity, are abused, beaten, tortured, and even killed by their own fathers and mothers for their defection. In some nations, our MTW missionaries must have as an emphasis of their ministry, one rail of their ministry as missionaries care for unnumbered street children in the spheres where they live and work. In this fallen world, the sight of injustice the preacher saw under the sun is the common experience of mankind. It's part of the vanity of vanities. But, but vanity is not completely unmitigated for the preacher, or for us. There is a perspective that we're taught to adopt. There's a solution of sorts, and it comes in two parts. First, he says, verse 17, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. Remember how earlier in this chapter, in chapter 3, the preacher taught us that there is a time for every matter? Well, so it is with injustice and justice. Injustice, though it may go on for a long time, for years, for decades, as in the case of Mr. Lamar, even for a lifetime, injustice of any sort is not the last word. God will have the last word. There is coming a day when God will judge both the righteous and the wicked. There will be remuneration for the righteous and there will be retribution for the wicked because, as he says, continuing in verse 16, there is a time for every matter and for every work. I think that the technological, the, the technical theological term for this is payday someday. God will judge the world with righteousness, the people with uprightness. We've just sung about that. God sees, God hates, God judges injustice and unrighteousness. As sure as God is holy, as sure as God is righteous, as sure as God is judge, He will make all things right. He will judge. In this way, the writer of Ecclesiastes is a whole lot like our Savior, isn't he? Who, who you remember, when he was reviled, did what? Did not revile in return. Suffering he did not threaten. No, what did he do? He continued to entrust himself to him who judges justly. That's what Jesus did. Those are the words of P. 
Peter's first letter in your Bible. And immediately before those words, he tells us that our calling is to follow in Christ's steps who suffered for us, leaving us an example. Now, how do we follow Christ? How do we follow his example? Peter leaves no doubt. We entrust ourselves to God. We entrust ourselves to his justice in the confidence that he will right all wrongs. He will make his justice known just as we sing so often and say in this house of worship. Now, Sometimes we get to see something of his justice in this life, don't we? We get to see glances of it during our lifetime. We've seen some examples of wicked people convicted of their crimes in the courts, of despotic rules, rulers toppled and so on. But know this, know this, at the right time, God will judge justly. For now we must wait. Wait patiently. An act of waiting, crying out with the saints in heaven who say, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. That's what the saints are saying in glory. And he will. God will. And you will see, though you cannot, fa- I know you can't, you cannot fathom right now how what you've seen will be made right, how it can possibly be that God will make everything beautiful in its time. The tapestry will be finished then, the tapestry which to our perspective now is all just knots and tangled. Just wait. Not till each loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly shall God reveal the pattern and explain the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver for the pattern he has planned. The second part of the solution of sorts comes by way of explanation beginning in verse 18. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. Now here Kohelet is starting to take hold of the tale of an explanation. I don't know whether that pun was intended or not. But uh, God allows these injustices for now with a specific purpose to test them. To test them. And testing them, he shows them for what they are. As As they practice injustice, as they tear others apart, as they take advantage of the widow and of the orphan, as they take bribes under the table, as they declare unjust judgments from the bench, as they show partiality, as they show favoritism, as they abuse those under their care, they are animals. Now notice the strong language here. Solomon doesn't say they're like animals. He says they are animals. On Friday morning, I went uh, to the farm as usual on a Friday morning to start my weekly trucking expedition to be greeted as often by four large yard dogs, each wagging its large tail nearly in sync with the others, a black lab, a um, chocolate lab, a yellow lab, and a German shepherd. I knew what they wanted, so immediately I donned my leather gloves, their yard dogs, and uh, starting, started into the petting fest. Ears crunched, backs stroked, shoulders stroked. They wanted it all, and to get it, they pushed and they shoved, and one of them has figured out to come up behind me and thrust himself right between my legs to get his fair share. And in his enthusiasm, though, to monopolize the attention, the shepherd started grabbing my hand with his teeth and pulling me in his direction. But when the yellow lab 
came up, the shepherd let go of my hand and turned. It started snarling and snapping at the yellow lab until the yellow lab just sort of shrunk away, tail between its legs. There is no justice with animals, is there? Animals are not infused with what you and I have because we are made in the image of God, this innate sense of justice. Only later, when I met that yellow lab alone on the other end of the yard that morning, was justice served, and it certainly was. When men practice injustice, they are animals. How else can we describe a culture such as, such as ours? slaughtering its own children before they're even born by the millions. We are animals devouring our own offspring to satisfy our appetite for autonomy. Why does God allow it to go on? To show the spade for the spade it is. And all the rest of verses 19 through 21 is simply the unfolding of the point. When people practice injustice, they descend to the level of beasts. They live like beasts. They die like beasts. He says, as one dies, the other does. There is for them, verse 19, no advantage over the beasts going to the same place, the grave that is, verse 20, so ignorant that they know not what comes next after this life. That's the point of verse 21. You see, it's not as though Colette does not know where the spirit of man goes after death. Of course, he most certainly does know. We, it, we, he tells us elsewhere in this same book. His question in verse 21, who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward, is not an agnostic one. Uh, as Solomon knows, what he is saying there is that Unjust men fail to reckon with the future that is most certainly coming to them. They don't know. They may live like beasts and die like beasts, but death will not release them from what they willfully refuse to believe now. They will stand before God. They will give answer for every deed done in the body. So back to us. What then? How shall we respond? Well, the, the preacher returns again to the theme that's now starting to become quite familiar to us. The lesson for us, even in the face of terrible injustice. Verse 22. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? Now, he's not telling us to be indifferent about injustice. He's not calling us to the Doris Day solution, que sera, sera, you know, whatever shall be, shall be. Where we can right injustice, we must, and there is plenty of Scripture that makes that point. But here, in this passage, this is the application to us. Even in a world rife with injustice, in the very places where we should find justice, it is good for us to do our work, to enjoy our blessings, to receive these things with thanksgiving from God. Even injustice needn't spoil your entire life. You know, even surrounded in piles of rubble created by Putin's unjust bombs, Ukrainian children can still play a game of tag. So Christians, though unable to, unalter, uh, to alter injustice past, present, or certainly future, that's the point of the question in verse 22, who can bring him to see what will be after him? In other words, you can't change the future, especially after you die. Who knows what's going to happen after you die? I say, Christians, you can still enjoy God's good gifts now. You can. You should. 
You must. You would think that Coalette is finished, wouldn't you? But he's not. He goes on in chapter 4. Again, I saw the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of the oppressed. And they had no one to comfort them. Why go back to the beginning, Solomon? Why, after giving the solutions, you remember what, that God will bring justice, payday, someday, that He is testing men for now. Why, after giving His counsel to live your life and enjoy your lot, why, I ask, must He go back now to injustice, back to oppression? The only explanation I can offer is that as true as the solutions he's offered must be, and as accurate as his counsel most certainly is, they do not dispel present injustice. Injustice is persistent pernicious and it's heartbreaking and it's heart-wrenching. Christians, we will continue to face injustice. We will continue to see injustice, heartbreaking injustice. We will continue to suffer injustice to one degree or another in our lives. Here's the sadness of Ecclesiastes. It's the true sadness of life in this fallen world. The true solutions are true solutions, yes, and they offer us some solace to be sure. But if even the saints in heaven are crying out right now, O Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell in the earth? Well, alas, we too are going to have to lament in this life the morass of injustice that swirls around us and, yes, sometimes sweeps us up in this fallen world. We cannot remain untouched by injustice, dear ones. Let's not confuse hope and indifference. We cannot remain untouched by injustice. There is a time for weeping. And for weeping with those who weep. But know this. Know this and hear this, my brothers and sisters, just as surely as there is a time for weeping, there is a time for rejoicing too. As one of my friends is in the habit of signing the end of each and every letter and message and email and note he sends out, heaven soon. Heaven soon. 